One of the things that hampered the early interpretation of fossils is that people approached the study of the natural world with ideas of the supernatural, like uh, dragons and unicorns, and um, thought that life could arise spontaneously. And so instead of interpreting this as an elephant, many sought more mystical explanations uh, of this. When uh, people found fossils, uh, they said, oh, well, I think that mud or rock or water can just become life. And so when I leave garbage out, you know, then flies pop out. When I look at mud, when the sun hits it, then um, uh, tadpoles and frogs pop out. Um, that I see all of these little critters under the microscope, that obviously life springs from non-life all the time. Now, that was the widespread belief. And I'm not just talking about, you know, you know peasant farmers who had never had the opportunity to go to school. Um, this was the people who were teaching in medieval universities, you know, the great minds of you know, the past, uh, you know, many of the, the past 2,000 years, held the idea that all of these living things could just kind of pop out of dust or dirt or mud or, you know, dank water or garbage or whatever. So this obviously plays into the idea of inheritance. If one doesn't appreciate that life only comes from life, then one doesn't connect the traits of the offspring to the um, uh, the traits of uh, the parents. And I just have some quotes, you know, going back here. And once again, these, you know, individuals being quoted here, these are great minds, you know, leaders of, you know, um, uh, understanding and the search uh, for knowledge. But I just use their uh, quotes here to show how widespread um, this uh, idea of spontaneous generation was. Now, I... Um, obviously, people in the past did not have the benefit of the libraries and the learning that we do. Um, but that being said, when we look at how individuals viewed reproduction, um, I would argue that perhaps this is the most embarrassing area to consider what was considered knowledge and wisdom. Um, because I would argue that um, reproduction and inheritance was perhaps a field where ignorance persisted to a far greater extent and for far longer than in many fields. So, for example, um, there were cultures, especially those that didn't have uh, farm animals, that never really got the idea that uh, males were involved in reproduction. Some thought that, well, you know, reproduction is just something that females did every now and then. Um, there uh, were some uh, who didn't really think that uh, uh, females, and in the case of human women, were involved, that maybe they did the um, site for uh, two uh, viewers in the case of, uh, of mammals and some other organisms, but they weren't directly involved. You know, and perhaps as a testament to this, um, when people first looked at sperm under the microscope, and yes, sperm was one of the first things that people looked at under the microscope, they drew what they saw. And what they thought they saw was a little person, essentially a baby, all coiled up with a tail. All right, so obviously they didn't see that. And so the fact that they drew that um, must mean that, you know, that's what they were expecting uh, to see. Um, and so some individuals thought that reproduction essentially happened in that um, males made little babies with tails that then would, you know, find a place to develop inside uh, the body of uh, the woman. Um, in the 1860s, uh, at around the time of Darwin and Gregor Mendel, who we're getting to, obviously, um, the, a major idea, perhaps the major idea of reproduction was this. How does the human body make sperm or ova? Um, well, uh, the, oh, I apologize. <laughs> Let me back up just a second. Just some other examples of, uh, you know, erroneous uh, beliefs. Um, so, for example, um, when it came to, say, uh, birth defects, um, what would, you know, cause inheritance, what would cause a birth defect? Um, well, many look for, say, like a psychic region. So, for example, some would argue that, oh, why was the child born with a hair lip? Well, a hare, a rabbit, must have crossed a woman's path 
And when she saw the hair, that mental image of the hair then was transformed into a physical characteristic of the um, uh, of the uh, infant. Um, some argued that, oh, the reason that, uh, you know, the child was very hairy was on the wall of the woman's house was a, a picture, say, of a saint or, or something who, you know, was, was wearing a, a sheep's robe and that just staring at that, you know, you know, transformed itself into, um, you know, a hair in the child. Um, there was a great author in the previous uh, set of uh, quotes, a um, very renowned figure who swore, and others did as well, that in their town, a woman gave birth to a mouse. She was pregnant, and she happened to, you know, while in her house, a mouse scurried across her path. It gave her such a fright that that mental image kind of transformed into uh, the shape of the theus, and she gave birth to um uh, a mouse. Now, obviously, this is, you know, ridiculous by modern standards. But once again, I'm, I'm trying to introduce the, uh, the significance of Gregor Mendel by introducing what was held at, uh, at uh, the time when he published. Uh, the major idea uh, was that of gemules. So if you ask, how do men make sperm? How do women make ova? And the answer is that um, just on a normal day, um, little pieces of stuff are what were called gemules. We're breaking off your eyes, your brain, your heart, your lungs, etc. And they would go down to your gonads, and they're like assemble little people. All right, and so that in certainly the sperm and perhaps the ova as well. You'd have to check with your 18th century, you know, 19th century authors. Um, that you would then build little people. And you know there, that's why the little people there would have little eye stuff, little brain stuff, little heart stuff, et cetera. Now, as this isn't just something which is silly, it then has repercussions. So for example, if you were a doctor treating a patient and your patient was, uh, was weak, they were ill, um, they had a disease, let's say that they were elderly and they were losing their eyesight, um, they were, uh, you know, finding it harder to move. They were losing their strength. What would be your diagnosis? And the answer is obviously then too much sex or too much masturbation, because you would argue that every time you make sex cells, um, that little pieces are breaking off your eyes, your brain, your joints, etc. The more of this that you do, the less eye stuff, brain stuff that you have left, and that's what caused your disease. That's why you're losing your eyesight. That's why you're decreasing your mobility. Uh, with age. And as ridiculous as this sounds, um, there were physicians in the United States in the early 1900s, 1900s, that if a child kept, say, getting tuberculosis, and you ask, what is the treatment for tuberculosis? The answer was a toothed penile ring. The argument was this child was mas masturbating at night, that was causing them to use, lose this vital stuff. And that was uh, causing them to be so weak. And if you could stop them, all right, by having a toothed penile ring that if they had an erection would then cause physical pain, this would cu cure their tuberculosis. I bring this up simply because ignorance has consequences. If you don't understand how reproduction works, if you don't understand how heredity works. This then affects you know, your views, not just of development and heredity, but of medicine and so many other things. And once again, I would argue that humans stayed ignorant of some of the basics of reproduction and inheritance for far longer than they did uh, in chemistry and astronomy and other fields. And so that is why Gregor Mendel is so uh, significant, because what Aristotle got wrong, what the great minds of the Middle Ages got wrong, Mendel got right in his garden. Mendel figured it out. Mendel answered all of the questions that all of the great minds had been getting wrong for thousands of years in his garden. Now, he had actually experimented a little beforehand with uh, mice. We really don't know what his conclusions uh, on these experiments were. Um, we do know that some of his superiors kind of frowned on his scientific uh, investigations and discouraged them. They thought he should be doing other things. And so, you know, perhaps that played a role in him not pursuing uh, his mouse experiments or 
after a while uh, leaving his uh, botanical uh, experiments. Mendel noticed that um, with peas, there were lots of strains which were true breeding. The purple flowered um, uh, pea plants always gave rise to offspring with purple flowers. The white uh, fl uh, flowered strain always gave right, uh, rise uh, to uh, individuals with white flowers, uh, et cetera, um, that there were tall strains and short strains and strains with green uh, pea pods and yellow pea pods and smooth uh, peas and uh, wrinkled uh, peas, etc. And so he thought that given that peas were cheap and e economical to keep, that they were easy to count, that he could then set up experiments uh, where he studied uh, inheritance um, in them. And so he would have two true breeding streams um, uh, which uh, differed in some obvious trait, like flower color or pea pod color, etc. And then he would then mate them. And it was easy enough to control the mating because with a fine brush, like a, a little paintbrush you would use to paint art with, you could then dust the pollen from the flower of choice and then dust it onto the female uh, portion of the flower of uh, the flower of choice. So he could control which pollen then pollinated which uh, flowers. And so then he noticed that um, when he mated a purple flowering strain to white flowering strain, that all of the offspring had purple flowers, all of them. Now, one of the predominant ideas of his day was that of blending uh, inheritance, that somehow you know, the, the parental uh, traits got blended together. But here in one generation of pea plants, he showed that that wasn't true. There wasn't a blending, that one of these traits seemed to be dominant over uh, the other so that the, the white flower trait was hidden. And then he uh, then took that generation, which did have a white flowered uh, parent, and then he bred them to themselves. So if he called this the filial one, the first uh, generation, let's say the, the, the children, if, if you would, um, and then mated those, he would get the F2 uh, generation, the grandchildren, if you will. And then he noticed that um, uh, the uh, white flowered uh, trait reappeared. So this had been in existence in one of the two parents in the parental generation. It had disappeared in the F1, but then lo and behold, here it was in the F2. Now, a lot of people would have stopped there. But Mendel's um, insight was he decided to count. He decided to then count how many um, uh, offspring had uh, the white uh, flowers uh, or the short stature, et cetera. So as Mendel looked at his traits, whether they be flower color or features of the, the pods or the height of the flower or the peas inside the, the flowers, et cetera, he counted. And he, in the second generation, the grandchildren, the F2, he was getting ratios like 787 to 277. So, you know, purple flowers to white flowers, or um, smooth pea pods uh, to wrinkled, or smooth peas to wrinkled peas, or tall plants to short plants, et cetera. So he counted. But his great insight was he noticed that all of the numbers, they cupped kept coming out to be about a three to one ratio. So um, the one trait which he called the dominant trait, because in an individual that had two different phenotypes in their parents, um, one seemed to hide the other. That the dominant phenotype seemed to uh, outnumber the recessive phenotype in the second generation by a ratio of about a three to one, all right? now. Um, this was his great uh, insight. He did publish his papers. Um, even Charles Darwin received it. As far as we can tell, I think it was unopened. Um, I, apparently, a lot of people saw the paper, read the paper, but whether it was the math or for whatever reason, they didn't get it. They didn't get that this was what they were looking for, what plagued Darwin perhaps more than anything, was inheritance was important in the, his theory of evolution, and he couldn't explain it. And he had a paper which founded uh, the study of genetics, and we, we're not sure that uh, he read it. Um, 
So Mendel then said, I keep seeing this three to one ratio. I think it's a thing. Um, how could I explain that? What could cause a three to one uh, ratio uh, in this F2 generation? And so what he then proposed was that for each unit of inheritance, which we call a gene, that there would be two alternate um, forms. Uh, one he would call dominant versus recessive. And what makes an allele dominant is that if you have a true breeding purple flower and a true breeding white flower and their offspring are purple, then purple is dominant. If the uh, offspring would be white, then white would be dominant. You don't know just by looking. You have to look at what the offspring are before you know which of the two uh, were uh, were dominant. Um, so he then said, all right, so there's units of inheritance. Um, he then reasoned that each individual then must have two in a regular body cell, two copies of this unit of inheritance. But when they make sex cells, the sex cells must have one of the two, but not both. All right. So Kudos to Mendel, because he was actually predicting the movement of chromosomes before chromosomes had been observed for the first time, before anyone knew what a chromosome was. Uh, Mendel had claimed that body cells have two copies of each chromosome. They are diploid, as we now use the term, whereas the sex cells, the gametes, are haploid with one copy of each chromosome. And that's what he called his law of segregation, so that even if each cell um, has two copies of each unit of inheritance of each gene, um, the sex cells, the gametes, and the pollen and uh, the uh, ova in the ovaries in the female flowers or sperm and ova, um, they just get one copy each, one form of the gene, which we call alleles. This was his law of segregation so that while these two alleles are together in most body cells, when individuals made sex cells, there would then just be one of uh, the two. And so we now, you know, use um, uh, terms like um, dominant and recessive, as he did. Um, but if uh, a cell has two of the same um, allele. Once again, an allele is a form of a gene. We refer to that as being homozygous. So this purple flower was homozygous for the dominant trait. We know it's the dominant trait because the offspring were purple. Um, this uh, individual has uh, was homozygous for the recessive allele. We know it was recessive because the offspring weren't white. And so that meant that the F1 generation received genetic information from both the male and, or yeah, the male and the female, the pollen and the ovary, um, uh, which is significant because once again, at this time, you know, not everyone was agreed that, you know, females were committing uh, a genetic material to the offspring rather than just a place to develop, et cetera. So he was saying that um, these individuals are going to have two copies of each gene, two alleles, but that one allele was coming from the male parent, one allele was coming from the female parent. There was a segregation in that the pollen didn't have both of those, just one of the two, maybe this one, maybe that one. The ova didn't have both of those, just one, maybe this one, maybe that one. That's what he called his law of segregation. Um, so the offspring were all heterozygous, hetero meaning different. They had two different alleles, and thus the heterozygotes display the dominant uh, trait. Then when the heterozygotes uh, mated, he noticed that three quarters on average had the dominant trait, while one quarter on average had the recessive trait. How to explain that? Well, he said there is a three to one ratio in what's called the phenotype, the outward appearance, whether the flowers were purple or white. Um, but then uh, thinking in terms of the alleles, he said that there would be a one to two to one ratio um, in that um, of the parents of the F2 generation, so the F1 individuals who were heterozygotes, when they then had um, uh, made uh, gametes, um, the gametes would be different because these would then segregate. All right, Mendel then um, 
uh, argued that um, uh, when this individual made, say, pollen, sperm, um, half of them would get the uh, dominant uh, allele, but then half would get the recessive allele. If you took this plant making, say, the ova, half of the ova would get the dominant allele, and then half would get the uh, recessive allele. And so if half of the ova have a big A, and half of the uh, sperm, the, the pollen, pollen or sperm when they divide, um, uh, have a big A, then one half times one half equals one quarter. One quarter of the time that you would then have individuals who receive a dominant allele from each parent. Um, sometimes, about a quarter of the time, you would have individuals who are receiving a recessive allele from the first parent, a dominant allele from the second. A quarter of the time, you get uh, the reverse, where individuals are getting a dominant allele from the first parent and a recessive from the second. And a quarter of the time, um, if uh, half of the sp uh, sperm and ova carry the recessive allele, um, that you would get individuals who are homozygous uh, recessive. All right, and so um, Mendel then um, explained how you could get that three to one uh, ratio and in the process uh, uh, described how chromosomes move. Now, we today um, realize this was not only important in describing uh, traits in pea plants, but also in corn, but also in fruit flies, but also in mice, and also in humans. Um, Mendel had discovered something universal, or, or close to universal, about inheritance. That's why this was so significant. So let's apply this to a human case. Let's say that there is a, uh, a, a trait, and let's call one version of the trait, we'll give it, you know, uh, we'll say the trait has, uh, we'll represent it with a T, and let's say that, you know, one allele will give a capital T, one allele will give a uh, a lowercase t. Now, in Mendel's law of segregation, he would hold that in this woman's cells, her cheek cells, her bone cells, her muscle cells, she would have two copies of this, um, uh, this T gene. In this man's uh, uh, skin cells, uh, bone cells, muscle cells, etc., he would have two copies. But when they make sex cells, the sex cells would just have one. Once again, he was predicting how um, chromosomes would move before anyone knew what chromosomes were. So if uh, this woman is homozygous for the big T allele, and this man is homozygous for the little t allele, then all of the sperm have little t's, all of the ova have big t's, and so therefore all of the offspring would be heterozygous. They would receive a a uh, big T from uh, their mother and a, um, a little T from uh, their father. Now, obviously, uh, this would then uh, determine, you know, some sort of trait. Uh, so we would know which was the dominant trait when we looked at the offspring. Um, and in, in that cross, all of the offspring would have the dominant trait, uh, whatever it was from the from So in Mendel's uh, across these would be the F1 offspring, or obviously they don't have to be related. If you had two heterozygotes, this woman is a heterozygote. So in her cheek cells, her muscle cells, etc., she has a um, dominant allele and a recessive allele. But when she makes ova, because of Mendel's law of segregation, her ova will have one allele or the other, but not both. When this man makes sperm, his sperm will have one allele or the other, but not um, um, both. And so then it's just the laws of statistics that half the time, this is the sperm that's going to fertilize the ova, half the time it's going to be this type. Half the time it's this type of ova that gets fertilized, half the time it's this type. And so a quarter of the offspring are then likely to get a dominant allele from each of the parents and then be homozygous dominant. Um, uh, a quarter of the time, uh, you have a heterozygote where the dominant allele came from the father. A quarter of the time, you have a heterozygote where the dominant allele came from the mother. And a quarter of the time, you get a recessive allele from each parent. So if you were to then look at the genotype, the description of the alleles, you would see that therefore there was a one to two to one ratio.
one quarter homozygous dominant, half heterozygous, one quarter homozygous um, recessive, a one to two to one ratio of homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive. But because the heterozygotes have the dominant uh, phenotype, then um, if you were to ask what would then be the phenotype ratio, all right, then these three would have the same outward appearance. So these three would have the dominant phenotype. This one would have the recessive phenotype. And then the uh, phenotype ratio on average would then be a three to one ratio. So in what's called a Mendelian cross, then you have a homozygous dominant individual and a homozygous recessive individual. Their offspring, the F1, their genotype is that they are heterozygous and they all have the dominant phenotype. In the F2 generation, the genotype ratio is one to two to one. One quarter homozygous dominant, half heterozygotes, one uh, quarter uh, homozygous recessive. The phenotype is three quarters have the dominant trait and one quarter have the recessive trait. So here we see two of Mendel's three laws, the law of segregation, the idea that if you have two alleles for each gene in most body cells, when you make sex cells, your sex cells have one or the other, but not both. That was his law of segregation, predicting the law uh, the uh, movement of chromosomes and the difference between haploid and diploid before anyone knew what chromosomes were. Kudos to Mendel. Um, and then his uh, law uh, of dominance, where if you have a heterozygote with two different alleles, one will hide the other, one will be dominant to the other. You will see a purple flower, not something that's half purple, half white. Um, if, uh, you know, for example, in humans, uh, if you're a heterozygous for the ability to roll your tongue, you roll your tongue just as much as someone who's homozygous uh, dominant. Um, if your blood type A um, it doesn't matter whether you have two alleles for being blood type A or one allele for A and one for O, your blood type A, we don't distinguish between them. So that the phenotype of this individual would be the same as this individual. Now, Mendel did have a third principle of independent assortment, which I'll get into a little bit. And I do have more to say about Mendelian inheritance and implying it at the molecular level. But the last point I'd like to make in this uh, video is the last thing, this isn't one of Mendel's rules, but I think it is just as significant as his three laws, the law of dominance, the law of segregation, and the law of independent assortment. Notice how Mendel reasoned through this. He said, if half the sperm have the dominant allele and half of the ova have the recessive allele, then you have a one half chance of this being the sperm involved. You have a one half chance of this being uh, the ova involved. And so a quarter of the offspring are going to be homozygous dominant. It's simple statistics. And if that isn't shocking to you, it's because you don't mid live in the mid 1800s. If you did and you asked, why does this individual have this trait? Why does this child have this trait? Why did this child have this birth defect? The answer would never have been with this parent and this parent. It's a quarter of you know, the children on average who will have this trait. The answer that you would have gotten is um, the woman looked at a rabbit and that mental image changed the fetus. Um, the woman did something wrong. There's a witch living down the street and the witch did something and that's what caused the, the fetus to change. Now, I'm not being silly. I mean, thousands of people were killed for witchcraft um, for ideas like this. You know, something happened. Who's to blame? Who's to blame because this, you know, uh, miscarriage occurred or because this child is this birth defect? I'll bet it was this person who cast a spell. I'll bet it's punishment because your uncle is a really bad person. And I'll bet that punishment is now being meted out, you know, in a karmic sense, you know, uh, because of your uncle now to you. So, you know, this trait was, you know, punishment for uh, an uncle. So when you ask why did this individual have this recessive trait, the answer would not have been, well, on, that's the law of averages that a quarter of the children of these two parents would have that trait. No, it was something, you know, the woman saw this, there was a spell cast, it's punishment, you know, um, 
et cetera. And Mendel said, no, it's just statistics, all right? There's a natural principle involved. You can make predictions. You can test your predictions. See this, if I predict that a quarter of the offspring are going to have this trait, you can then go and test that. Before Mendel, genetics was full, or in heredity, this, the study of reproduction, was full of just you know, mysticism and beliefs of the supernatural. It wasn't testable. Um, it was just largely superstition. But in his garden, Mendel changed that. He changed what people were unable to change um, for thousands of years, even people who wanted to, like Aristotle and Darwin. They wanted to figure out inheritance and, and they just didn't get it. Mendel did in his garden. Mendel made genetics a science and started to take away, you know, just the ignorance which had plagued humanity for thousands of years in the topics of reproduction and development which is why is it appropriate when we study genetics to start with Mendel and to call this form of inheritance Mendelian inheritance. And then I'll pursue this further um, and but then talk about exceptions to Mendelian inheritance in subsequent videos.